Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Just Slap Podcast. Your boy, Stephen Alex here, joined by a very special guest, Mr. Thomas Alm. Thomas, thank you. Uh, I, and by the way, am I pronouncing that right? Because I know a lot of Swedes give me a lot of uh, pushback in terms of, like, I, like we have Fabian, who's like our very close friend, and he said that I've never pronounced his name right. No, like, it's Fabian. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's uh, usually Americans say, they say Alm, like yeah. Alms for the poor. Yeah. But it's Alm. Alm. Alm is, is the, the tree Elm. But in Th- Swedish. Thomas Alm. Yeah. All right, there you go. I got it. But I doesn't. <laughs> L- legendary tennis coach, work with so many players. I mean, you're close to like 30 years in experience here. Yes, right? a, little, a little over 30 years. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we don't have 30 years between us <laughs> in experience in anything. But uh, no, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really excited for this. I'm really excited for this because, I, and I was telling Alex this off camera. I was like, I'm really excited for today's episode because uh, our guest today, not only is he a like, really experienced tennis coach and, and knows about like the world of the lower level professional tennis that I'm personally fascinated about. Uh, but, uh, he's kind of sick in the head. And I mean that, I mean that in like the best way possible. Um, like for the people that don't know you, like just, just to give a little, you know, reference in your off time, when you're not trying to produce tennis champions, you, you like to torture yourself by running ultra marathons. Uh, Kind of, yes. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. Kind, kind of, of accurate, yes. Yeah. He doesn't see it as torture. He sees it as... Well, sometimes uh, it is. It depends. Some... It depends. You know, like I did an, an ultramarathon like uh, two weekends ago. And that was just a nice jog around Gozo Island in Malta. It's like 32 miles. But it was, uh, it was nice. I didn't get that tired. It was just a jog. You know, I finished mid-pack and, and that was it. But if you want to push yourself, obviously, and if it's extremely far, like if you go in 300 miles, then obviously it's... it's um, it's tough. Well, you mentioned the uh, the one race that because that's what I heard. Uh, ultra marathons or anything that's above twenty six miles. Yeah. The longest race you ran was how long? One hundred three three hundred. No, the, the longest one. No, the, is, in one shot. In one it, shot. It, the sorry. longest I've run in one shot is two hundred forty six k, which is about one hundred thirty five miles. Yeah, I mean, without that's... stopping. <laughs> and, uh, it was forty hours and thirty two minutes when I won that. So yeah, I started at eight Friday morning. So it was a race. And then, yes. And you won the race. That that time, yes, <laughs> yes. So how does one run 130 something miles in one shot? Like how, like, what did that look like? I can't even, what, what he, I can't even ima- imagine what that's like. What, he, what he's trying to ask is when did you realize you were a psychopath? <laughs> I, I was always a psychopath, but, <laughs> but uh, what happened was um, I got a call at 1158 at night, at night's PM, right? Yeah. Yeah. We yeah, don't yeah. do AM PM. We say 23, yeah, but 23. yeah. So 1158, uh, uh, April 28, 2010, that my mom had died because she was in the hospital. She died from, from lung cancer. And so she's only 59 and I always had, so in Sweden, I was, I had clubs. I had one club for like six years and one for 11 and almost 11 years. And I always had like someone who was really, really into it more, like someone I would play extra with, like help extra. You know, like a, someone who was a little bit better. And at this time, I didn't because the last one had gone to college. And it, it would turn out I would get a new player just a couple of months later. But I didn't know that at this time. So I was out in the club and I didn't have that to put my time into. My mama just died. It was May 1st. It was a Saturday. And I figured I'm going to go out running. And I ran like, a, it's like 15.4K. So it's almost 10 miles. And I was dead. Like I could barely, like I was not good at this at all. But I felt like this was, this was a nice outlet. So then I found like a... a a 16k a 10 mile loop from my my apartment in stockholm and i said like okay i'm gonna run um and i just ran every day and then i did the new york marathon that year i did the stockholm half in september and then new york marathon uh first first sunday of november and then it's like this is cool and i started doing more and then i did ironman in cozumel mexico ironman triathlon in 2011 and then i just i did comrades in 2011 also which is the the, the biggest ultra marathon in the world where you go from Durban to Peter Smartsburg in South, uh, South Africa. So they go on odd years, I think it is. Yeah, they go up and uh, it's up the mountains and on, on even years you go down. It's through the Drakens Mountains. So it's like, it's so much, it's, so, it's just, it feels like it's up for like for 89K. So I don't know what that is in miles now, but yeah, it's like a hundred oh, and long, long. hundred something. It's no, long. it's less than hundred. It's like, oh, well, it's, it's far. And um, <laughs> it's far. yeah, so I did that. And then I just kept running. I've done some projects, you know, for cancer research. I did 40 ultra marathons and, and, and mar- marathons and ultra marathons in 2016. And uh, I've done New York Marathon a few times. I've done, my favorite race is the, the Great New York 100 in June. What is uh, that? 
It, it, it starts in, in, in um, Times Square uh, by the TKTS booth. Oh, wow. Uh, but like at, at five, you're there like at 4, 44, 45 in the morning. It's like 100 people. Uh, it's a very low key, small race. Um, that, it's Phil McCarthy, who is an ultra legend. He puts it on that. And it's, it's a great race. And you start and you go, go north and then you go out and you go to Queens. And, you go, and if you go the 100 miles, you, go, you, you also finish in Manhattan. In, in Times Square. But if wow. you go, I did 100K. So I've done that twice. And you, you finish in Queens. So, yeah, that's an amazing race. And uh, yeah, and I just kept doing uh, ultra marathons. And I just kept running all the time. And when the, I did, the, like, I ran, I ran through Sweden in 2017. And then I did it again. Just, just quickly. And, when you say you ran through Sweden, like, you literally ran from the one end of the country to the other end of the country. Yeah, so, so the, the, the toughest ultra marathon in Sweden is 135 miles, right? And that goes from the, from the west coast to the east coast and back to the, kind of back to the west coast. But, but Sweden is like a long country, like yeah. thin, you know, so it's not that far between the east and the west, mm-hmm. but from the, from the north um, to the south, it's, it's far. So I would do about 52 kilometers, 30, was that 32 miles? Yeah, per day for 40 days. And just go. And I had a friend with me who was driving a car. He had like food and candy and cookies and stuff. And I would just go. And then in 2020, when the pandemic hit, um, I, I ha- was lucky enough to have a friend that was able to, to uh, be my crew again. And so I thought, why not do it from s- south to north also? Nobody has done it both ways. Wow. <laughs> Strangely enough. Like, <laughs> so, Strangely I, yeah. not, so not I figured so like, yeah, let's, so let's, just, let's just do this. It's fun. And you, you, the only thing, because it's an easy life if you like running. You just have to, f- you know, take one step, one foot in front of the other and just go. You don't have to think about anything. You get, you know, I stayed in nice hotels. I ate in restaurants, you know. I just had to run and then, you know, take a shower and sleep and eat and rinse, repeat, you know. So, so. But tell me about the 130-something miles straight. Yeah. So that took you 40-something hours, right? 40 yes. hours, something. 40, like. 40 hours and 32. We started 8 in the morning Friday, and then 32 minutes past midnight between Saturday and Sunday, that's when I finished. So how does that... So can you explain that process? Like, the those 40 hours... Yeah. Uh, I mean, what did you experience? Uh, you experience a little of everything, because in the beginning, it's just fun. It's an adventure. You go... And I was leading that race basically from beginning to end. So... When I was almost at the halfway point to turn, there was one guy who ran up to me, and we ran together for a while. And there was two guys, two Russian guys, that, were, that looked tough, but they were like one hour behind us. So my friend Johan, who was my, my support, was also the support when I ran through Sweden the first time, was a chiropractor who helped me. He, he, say he was keeping track of them, because there was, um, there was the, the, the cell coverage wasn't that good, but you had an app, so you could, you know, you could see where everyone was at all the time because you're spread out, obviously. Mm-hmm. And uh, he would have an iPad and see where they were all the time. And then he would be in like a small town and he would like, give me something to eat or drink or whatever and I would keep going. And then he would say like to me, like come up, oh, yeah, they're what, like one hour behind you or they're this far behind you and whatever. And I was like getting stressed because they're closing in on you, Thomas. They're, they're Russians, they look tough, they're closing in on you. So when we were like 171 kilometers or something, just after I got hit by a car, because I was running, and I fell asleep running on, like, a street, with, like, because I was so tired. And, and I, I go like this, and I just fall asleep, and the, the rearview mirror hits me. Wow. But, but they just go like this, right? I mean, they're obviously not an old car, but in new cars, they just... Yeah, they fold. Yeah, so they right. just folded, so it's no problem. But that was, like, scary. I almost pissed myself. So that was... And that, so I woke up, and then when it, yeah, it was, like, 171K into the 240 six kilometer race i i made like a move and i just said okay i'm gonna go for it and run away from the other guy that i was running with and i beat him in the end by like five hours but johan was always like you gotta the russians are close the russians are close and then like i i get to the the finish line it's in the middle of the night we go and i'm like dead and you know, you know i have something to, to eat we had falafel i remember i go in finish my french fries and i like sit in the shower like this and I, I come out, I was like, what happened with the Russians? No, no, they, they quit after half the race. Oh, I have wow. said wow. this for you to keep going. So you, like, you kind of destroyed them mentally. I, I don't know if they, or no, the, just the distance. Used them as a, yeah, like my friend. Used them as a way like, to push them. So he, he knew that they had finished. But this is after you made the move, right? No, this is like, no, no they, they finished, they, they did like half, and then they turned and came back to one small town. But they stopped there. Uh-huh. That they quit They're because just they like, were I'm dead. Out. And uh, but Your he he kept saying you. to me that they were getting closer all the time. 
I was like, oh, now you gained a little bit. Now they're getting closer. I was like, and I was oh. like so stressed. So after the race, I asked, like, when did they get in? Like, how much after me? It was like 15 minutes. They got, no, no, they quit after like 55% of the race. I That's just told hilarious. you this because I wanted to get home. That's hilarious. <laughs> That's... Just keep going. I'm like, well, it worked. That's awesome. So, but you get, you, you go, you go and then you start hurting and then something cramps and, and something that you would like, you're jogging all of a sudden your arm cramps like this and you're like, ah, oh, you have to like, and then you think like, oh, this is not going to work or your knee is hurting or your foot is like something is like, this is so bad. Like it hurts. Like I'm going to throw up, but then you just, you just push through it. And then in 45 minutes you feel like fresh. How and many, then if you feel bad again, it's like, it's a roller coaster. How many calories you burn? I, I don't really know. Like, but I know that when I ran through Sweden the first time, so now I've gained a bit because I'm doing a project later to lose weight. So I, I, I've been eating and I'm a little bit puffy now, but I, I, I was about always like around 75 kilos, mm -hmm. what, whatever that is in, mm -hmm. in pounds. And I remember that when I ran through Sweden the first time, I ate more so that I would have some something to, to, to burn. And I was, what was I at? 78.5, I think. Yeah, 78.5 kilos. So I gained two and a half or three and a half. And then when I, when I finished, I was 69.5. So I lost nine kilos. Wow. And I consumed on average 7,000 calories per day. Wow. <laughs> so That's crazy. Like cookies. I'm a vegetarian since 11 years now. So... Veggie burgers, fries, you know, I have two burgers and fries. I have pizza. I just eat Oreos. I don't know how many Oreos I ate. And then, like, potato chips. Like, because he would take the car and he would go. And, like, five kilometers later, if I needed something, I would open the trunk and eat something. If not, say, like, go another five and I keep going. So that's how we did it. And, and so, yeah, 7,000 on average. And, uh, and you lost nine kilos. I lost kilos. nine kilos. But I think a lot of it was muscle mass also, obviously. Wow. So, yeah. That's absurd. It wasn't only fat-free mass, unfortunately. That's crazy. So, yeah, so and I was then, thin. But you're just taking anything you can. Right? Anything. Because after, after a while, Coke, also in marathons... Beer. Like, I mean, maybe not beer. Yeah, yeah, no, I don't I don't really drink alcohol, but I mean, I drank... Uh, I, I drank Cola Zero. I don't, I don't like drinking calories. Like, yeah. That's also the, the worst thing if you want to lose... Like lose people weight. who don't, don't want to gain weight, don't never drink your calories. So for some reason, I just use Cola Zero. Maybe I should have a regular Coke. But after a while you don't like anything and all of a sudden you get a craving for something crazy and then if you have a support if you're, if you're lucky enough they will go and get it for you why coke awesome. why coke zero though because there's one drink calories no but yeah. but i understand that but isn't the point if like i understand you don't want to drink calories. i don't know i just have a thing for it i just don't like for some you know i don't know some, sometimes it's just i'm an idiot i also think coke zero <laughs> tastes by the way tastes better than regular coke i like That's it better now because opinion. i'm used to it so i, I like yeah. it better uh, i like it better now because I'm used to it. I mean, I, I bet if I started drinking regular Coke and I did that for whatever time, yeah. I would probably like it better. But I don't know. I try not to drink it too much either of it, but it's good. So can you do? Okay. Wow. So besides, besides the, you know, 100, 200 mile races. Fascinating. You're, you've also worked with a considerable amount of uh, professional tennis players, both WTA and ATP. But it seems like you've kind of like almost chosen to work more with the WTA players. Would you yes, say that's yeah. fair? I, I like. I always liked working with with the women better. Okay. Now, now for like for guys like us and people that may not be too involved with that world, what what are the differences between coaching an up and coming WTA player versus coaching an up and coming ATP player, if if there are any? Well, the guys, the, the biggest thing I think between with, with men and women to coach, even with juniors, is that if if you're a if you're a guy, you will look at okay, there are, I'll take some from that coach, what he's saying, then I have something from her, some from that, some from that, and you'll make up your own. Usually when a, when a girl or a woman decides like, okay, I want you to be my coach, they would just do what you say much more, you know, and they will just, that's, that's the, the main thing. There's um, a more direct relationship it, between. Yeah, you, they, they will do like, if you really, if you're lucky, and I've had twice, like one girl in, that I started coaching in 99, and one girl that I started coaching in 2021, and both of the, so I'm thinking like 21, so in, what is that? 2043, I will get a new one, who actually does what you tell them on court, like, fully, you know, and that's when it just, they just blow up, like, they go, they go really well, so, I, I mean, I started with clubs in Sweden, and um, the girls always did well, but also, the thing with tennis is, it doesn't matter if you are the god of tennis, if you get someone who, you know, if, if, if they don't have the, the level, if they didn't play a lot when they were little, it doesn't really matter, you know, if, if you haven't played a lot up until 10, you're not going to become really good, basically. Like, it's a very, very small chance. You should play a lot when you're young and specialize early, and that's, you know. So 
But so my first club where I started, one of the girls there, she won like at 15, we started working more, you know? And, and I always had the idea that I have, um, in Sweden we have non-profit organizations for the clubs. So I had my salary, I had my club, and I had my competition groups, and we had like never had anyone in the top 10 of, of Stockholm even in that club. Because the biggest club in, in Sweden is two kilometers away uh, that have all the elite and whatever. So I just went all in on this, and I was working, I mean, seven days a week, like all the time, like from morning to night. And there was one girl, she wanted, she wanted it to be, become good more than the others. So what I would like, I would say, okay, as long as you're doing the fitness, you're doing what I say on court, like I'm not gonna charge you as much as you wanna play. If you call me and say, I wanna play three to five tomorrow morning, we will go. There's no problem, like as much as you want. And then it's so funny, I remember she was like, she, she called me one night and she's like, hey, I'm, I was just, I have half the off from school tomorrow. Do you think maybe we could? I said, yeah, what time? And we just, and she was like, she just, oh, he was not full of shit. Like, yeah, he's and busy. then we started playing more and more and more. And I mean, yeah, now we have this on video also. She was the girl that was playing, like, she was playing forehand volley. This is her volley. Her, she didn't turn. She didn't turn the racket. She had like, two forehand Yeah, volley. she hit like, she, she had like, you know, old ladies that stand, you know, have their, and they go like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She didn't, she didn't know. And she was 14. And she was like 149th in Sweden in her age group. And it, when, when we finished, she was the second best. And she was like 1,000 in singles, and like 809, I think she was in doubles. But she only did half a year after, after high school. And then she went to UCLA. And she was on the, I think it's 20, I think it's 2007. But she was on the first team that won the thing for UCLA, the team thing. So they got to go to the, yeah, so they got to go to the White House and meet the president and and stuff like this. Oh, wow. So that was cool. And for people in Sweden, they're like, oh, president, they don't understand that this is a (laughs) big deal. I'm like, what the hell are you, you understand this? Okay, like, come on. (laughs) So that was pretty cool. And then the the girls that I had usually, some of them, they wanted to play some extra. So we did. Some of them wanted to play more or less and and that's it. And it it was always natural and they always did well. Um, So then in 2016, uh, I left. Yeah, 2016. Yeah, 2016, with the Jacob, who is one year older than uh, Fabian. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, so he's, he's 95, and he wanted to go for it. And I said, like, okay. I mean, I knew that he was not going to be a superstar. Uh, also, because when he came to me at, he was 15, like, but turned 16, and he had a problem with his shoulder with the serve. So we had to re, like, totally redo his serve and forehand, like totally, which is not easy when you're about to turn 16, to to do that. And we did that, and then he, he played, and he was also like around like a thousand. And we did a few years down in Spain. And then when the pandemic hit, uh, he was offered a job, and we went back to Sweden because we didn't have any lockdowns, which was good. So that's when I did my second run through Sweden. He was my support. And then he started that fall working. And I just sold my apartment in Sweden, and I just bought one down in Spain. And I was like, told Fernando at the, at the academy, like, I need a job because I don't have a job now, and I have not that much money anymore because I spent everything for this apartment. And he's like, okay, cool. So I started working with the competition group of the academy in, in Spain. And uh, yeah, then in 2021, Daria Semenistaya came along, a uh, Latvian girl, and I, I started coaching her. She's the, she's the one who had the, the, like, I mean, you guys started and she was like 1,200. Well, well she, right? the thing was, she's, she's born in 2002, and there was a Latvian family there. Uh, Daniel Morozov is playing now in, in Texas. Um, he's quite good. Like, he's playing number one for them, I think. Mm-hmm. Is it Ab- Abilene Christian or... Something like this. Yeah, he's, he's quite good school. And uh, so they, because she did, she was in, during the lockdown, she was in Dubai where her Russian boyfriend was with her family. They had a coach there uh, and everything, but they were, they were stuck. So when she, she, apparently she told them, like, I want to make, I want to try to go for tennis because she'd been top, like uh, just inside the top 40 as a junior. I want to try to, to go for it. And they were talking because they knew, because they're the same age, Daniel and, and Daria. And they were like, oh, but try, come here. It's nice here. And you just, you know, give it a go and whatever. And so she had been, because she had like an extreme forehand grip and she had been trying to open it up during that year. And so when she came there, she was going to do, she paid the academy and Fernando, the, the director, for two weeks. Uh, so the, he goes to me, like, we have a girl who wants to be professional. And usually I was the go-to person at the academy for those players. So, okay. So, and she was slicing. It's funny if you go back to the UTRs that she was playing in the beginning, like she was slicing the forehands like this. She's a grinder. And we started working on her forehand, we started working on stuff. And I said, like, the first day, like, I mean, you are, you are amazing. If, if, I mean, because she said, like, everything I did, she just said, she just did. Um, if we work together, you're going to be top 50. Like, I guarantee it, for sure, you're going to be top 50. Like, and she was like, really? Like, I win, like, one match in 15K. So I was like, no, <laughs> you're going to rip through that easy. And by this year, you're going to be around 500. 
the next year you're going to be by the end of it or at least the year after you're going to be in 2023 you're going to be in slams and you're going to be top 50 by 2023 you're going to be top 50 for sure like, he said let's go so we spoke to Fernando and he gave uh, gave me like I got a like super small salary I got after tax it was 540 euros and I, and I lived at one room in the academy and she did too and they made like a contract and then yeah we started working and traveling I mean we did 15 months and she went from 1200 around to, to 271 wow in 12 months yeah, so for the first five months, she won seven 15Ks, including three in a row in Cancun. And then she won uh, like five. So she won, yeah, five of, five of those, seven of those, three 25Ks and five UTRs. Wow. So was 271 her highest ranking? Then, yes. Time? Then. Did yeah, now, she's, now she's like... No, no, she get. I mean, the thing was, she got... So there was, we were in Cancun in, um, in February of 2022. And... I think we haven't really spoken about. It. I think like that she did like an amazing tournament there because it was so tough. There was two match, there was three matches to qualify, and um, she beat like two unranked like EC. Then she beat uh, a four twenty who was number one seed in the qualies in a, in a super tie break. And then in the main draw she beat uh, she beat Carol Shaw. Shaw is that her name? The Canadian who's like she was like then one ninety or something mm -hmm. maybe like two. I don't remember something two hundred uh, around there. She beat someone who's like 230 in the quarters. She beats Hibino, who is 130 in the in the yeah, no, the second in the quarters. She beat Hibino. Then she beat someone like 240 in the semis. And Elena Glushko, the Israeli, who's like 350 in the finals. Um, uh, semi match point. And after that, it was like she she felt like, oh, I want to go for Grand Slams now. And then unfortunately, and I understand like she was young and she wanted to get, so she wanted to go. Now she won, oh, we got this tournament, that tournament. And we had a deal that we were not gonna switch surfaces too much she liked to play a lot but you know in practice i can keep a track of her so that we can practice really hard without getting injured mm -hmm. but in a match like all bets are off she's not gonna it's not like she oh you know don't put pressure on your left foot because i mean it doesn't work right yeah, yeah. so switching surfaces and this and that and back and forth and i tried to stop her but it didn't work so then um then she got injured in uh in her foot and she had like five six weeks off uh in the yeah like july there and then, uh, but the first, the first seven tournaments that she won was in five, five months. And then she was, she was like the player of the year. She won the most titles with only playing five, like five months for 21. But um, yeah, so then she was in Riga for, for a few, um, uh, for those weeks doing rehab with like the Olympic Committee doctors or whatever. And then, yeah, she fired me and the, <laughs> and the, and the academy. What was the, what was the reason? She I, she, I, I don't know. Like we had, uh, um, she ha she made a contract with the academy for twenty percent of her prize money for five years, and I told her at the time like, but you're gonna be in, in, in slams. I mean, it's a lot. Of, it's like a it's like eighteen k has to be in the qualies. Like this is not a good deal for you. Yeah. You know, I'm winning like one match in the fifteen k. What are you talking about? It's like then, so but for different reasons they took that out of the of the the the, the twenty percent. They took it out of the contract for some reason, and and then uh, so they could just jump ship and. I told her because after we were there, it's funny, uh, when, when Raducanu fired her coach after the US Open, I yeah. said, like, once you get into slam qualities, you will fire me for sure because of this. She goes, like, no, of course not. What would I do? I mean, uh, what can she say to her defense? Like, yeah, she said, yes. Say, yeah, I will fire But then her. I would just maybe, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, so then, yeah, she was so close to getting into slams. So then she fired me. And, they, and, they, and she didn't have to pay the 20% anymore. I think that's it. But then I, I met her and I asked, like, but no, that wasn't it. So, but can't you just tell me? Like, I, I, I'm always curious about everything. You know, so I said, can you just tell me why? And she goes, uh, it's like, but okay, if I, if I, if we actually like bump into each other in 20 years when you quit sure. and we have a coffee, will you tell me? Yeah, then I'll tell you. So she didn't tell you why? No, I have no idea. No idea. It was wow. amazing. I, I, and it's I, clearly not like results because she, no, you, no, you no. took her from 1200 yeah, to yeah. And I would say, I would say because when, when she won the 25K in, in Bostad, close to Mama, in, in, in or in Ystad, sorry, close to Mama in Sweden, she, she, her, her, the, plantar fasciitis tendons under her both feet were so bad that we stayed in my friend's because he wasn't there we stayed at his uh, apartment and it took her like 45 minutes to be able to walk in the morning that's how much wow, she was hurting wow. and I tried to have it like rest days no 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 rest week it doesn't no we have to go play this UTR we have to go play this and so she really wanted it a bit too much and uh, yeah maybe I wasn't good enough a coach to, to, to convince her to not do it and uh, yeah so then then uh, 
I don't that. <laughs> I thought I thought the Raducanu situation was different though because wasn't he like a temporary coach? Like wasn't he the, just there with her for the, I, I think for the his, U.S. I, I heard that his contract was was until then or something like this. Yeah, like, I yeah. think he. I think and he didn't they didn't renew it. Kind yeah. Of. But we didn't, I mean, I never, I have never really had a contract with anyone. Like, it, I had a contract when I was working at the club in Spain because they had to make some kind of contract because he was paying the taxes for me. Right. Mm -hmm. But I don't really. And with Daria, they had a contract. I was going to get 10%, half of the 20 all the time. I never took it though. Um, and, and five out of the 15 months we worked together, I gave her my salary so we could keep, like, because she was stressed about money. Wow. Uh, but it's fine. So, so that was, yeah, that was it. And then, uh, Maybe maybe it's because of that. I I, I wouldn't know. It's it's crazy. Um, she it's has cra her reasons, I guess. I, it's it's crazy because you said, like you, you got her in the beginning, and you were like, I can make you like top fifty. I said right? you will be top fifty. Yeah. Like and every everything that we said by the year, she was she actually did it. It's crazy. Like it, all the way. That and, must and, be a good feeling. And but, she's doing well now. So I mean, I cannot really say. I mean, because as I, I I don't like the thing, the fact of saying because this is what many what people in Sweden is a lot. We have something they call the uh, Jan de Logan. You, you have a there's a there's a clip with Alexander Skarsgård at one of the talk shows when he speaks about this also. It's a law of jante, which means that don't think that you're special, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like in Sweden, like don't think you're you're something. He talks about hiding his Emmys because he's like he doesn't want to show off his accolades, and that's kind of true. So in Sweden, when people go, oh, that's nothing. So so it's it's a lot. It we have a lot of that uh, going, and and when people when people in Sweden usually do, they go. Oh well, you made this per like whoever it is. This coach made player X go from here to there. They'd be like, well, you know, if you would have had a better coach, you would have done even better. Gotcha. Which is like, but then you can say that about every. That's I don't yeah. really like that. So, yeah. I mean, I think of course that if she were with me, she would be top fifty by now for sure and be a contender to go far in slams. I think so. But you can't fault her. I mean, you cannot say that she made the wrong decision because she was two seventy one, and now she is close to top hundred. So, you know, you and I told her this also, like. I, I don't know what the country look, looks like, but if you want to, if you don't want to work with me, then I'm not going to pursue my half of the 20%. Like, I'm, I don't care. Like, I, I, it doesn't matter. Like, I want to work with you, but if you don't want to, then that's up to you. Yeah. And that's fine. Uh, I mean, I would have worked to, with her for, for 10 years more, obviously, but that's fine. And uh, I told her also, and I tell everyone, like, you have to do what is best for you. Uh, it's an individual sport. Yeah. That so you have to do what what you feel is best, and if if that's what you feel, then that's what you should do. Do you find that most times when players make decisions for themselves, so let's say like this for example, you know you got her to two seventy one in the world, and then she decided to move on and and wanted to you know uh, get someone else. That's kind of a, a selfish, not, and, and for good or for bad, mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but. The point is, is that it's a decision she made about you know uh, her career and, and she was like, okay, this is what I want for me. Do you think that most players that make those decisions, does it turn out to be a positive or a negative? Like, what do you see in, on tour? In, in your I mean, experience? it's so hard to say. I, I, I would say it's 50-50. That's why it's so hard. Like, even if, 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 she, if she would have had all the data of, of how players do it and if they succeed, if it goes better or worse, I think it's 50-50. Because some people, you know some players, they, they just linger on with the same coach for too long. Right. Also, but usually when that happens, it's like you, you go somewhere, you're at this ranking and the next two years you're at the same ranking. Okay. Like, but so usually not when you're going like up a lot, but, but, and also I think if you feel that this coach has taken me this far, but I don't think that he or she is going to take me further, then of course you have to make a move. I right. mean, this is just, it, it's, you will be stupid not to. <laughs> I mean, right. So, f f I mean, there's no hard feelings about that. Obviously you should, you should do what you want to do. And she's doing great. So it's like. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what do you look for? So like you have, you, I'm sure you have people reaching out and saying, I want to work with you. Like, what do you, cause I also know like, like you don't seem like a <laughs> guy. So, so if, if, if you immediately sense that, okay, like my style or this person's not going to listen to me, you just won't work with them. So what do you look for in the players in the future potential players that you could work with? Well, there's always the first thing that they've had, they have to have, played enough tennis at this like if you're 20 years old and there are some players you know that they haven't played enough they started late they haven't played enough tennis they don't have enough tennis in their body over the years so they're not going to be able to be really good and you you know that but if someone has that which most of the players on tour they have even if they're like what a thousand they have played a lot of tennis and they started early then i mean i, I it's it's kind of chemistry and i have to feel like i want to feel like i'm inspired uh, really inspired 
and the two girls that I work with after Daria, um, I mean, th they have had and they have great potential. And so, uh, yeah, you, you I, I always just do things. I don't really go like, oh, it's like I get gut feeling and I think about it for a second and then I just go. Um, and uh, yeah, it's sometimes you find out things later, obviously, like in a relationship, if you're with someone, you're gonna, you know, everything looks good, you know, and then, uh, you know, when you're dating someone, everything is good. And then you find some stuff and you just, you just hope that those things are not going to be deal breakers. Right. And, and sometimes they are. And so, um, yeah, it's not easy. It's what, not easy. What are some of those deal breakers in uh, coach player relationships? In your experience? I, I find the hardest for me has always been tournament planning. Like the, the players, they, they want to, you know, they go by feeling and they don't, it's, they're not smart with the choices they make in terms of tournaments. That's, that's the number one thing, I think. And also it's, if, if I have a player, it's not usually that we have a difference of opinion how they should play necessarily. Mm -hmm. Most often it is, so I say to you, okay, um, we should practice this much. And you go, no, but I don't think so. We could take a little bit less there and we can do this instead. And then the discussion is always like, it's never that they want to do more than I want. You know, it's not like, you know, they want to do it tougher and I'm too nice. It's always that, no, they don't want to say, oh, that's too tough for me. Instead, they say, oh, you know, maybe I can do this and I have my foam roller and maybe I can do that for, you know, and then, <laughs> then you're like, OK, but nobody had a foam roller before. Sweden, were the, we were the best country in the world. We played four hours super tough of tennis and we went out for a run and we went to the gym and we were the best. Yeah. And then you have younger coaches now who are like young kids like yourselves. And they come up and they go, oh, but you don't have to play that much. You can do this and that. And you can have this roller. You can have this, you know, whatever. And then um, and I'm like, but we suck now. <laughs> like if you show me something else that you do instead of the four hours of tennis and the running in the gym, and we are actually as good, I'll take it. If you can work less and get the, great res the same great results, let's do it. But we're not, you know? Yeah. Because it's BS. We had so. a, we had a, a, a Bogomolov. Uh, Alexander on the on the podcast, oh, yeah. and he, I mean, he talked about growing up with his dad. His dad actually, funny enough, coached Alex's with dad. My dad's in, coach in Russia. Yeah. Cool. And but but he used to Small like world. we used to ask Very him like like what kind of training did you do? And he goes, dude, what do you mean? We would play tennis all day, and he would go, he would drop me off, and we would go run until I collapsed. Yeah. Like he was like that. Like yeah. my uh, my dad tells a story. Uh, they would travel to tournaments by train in across the Soviet Union. And, uh, you know, these train rides oftentimes were very long. And so they would, you know, the train would go for a couple hours and would stop for like an hour or whatever. And then it would, they would everyone would get back on board and then it would go mm -hmm. again. And, you know, so that's how it kind of went. And every train stop, uh, his coach, Bogomol's dad, would have them run. Yeah. During the during the so they'd sit on the train, they'd get off and then go running for whatever an hour, like any second they could get, any time they could yeah. get to to run or whatever. It was they were doing it. So it is a different, it is a different approach and different mentality entirely. And mm -hmm. you, I mean, being an ultra marathon runner, I feel like that trickles in. You can't be like you can't have the mentality of train smart, not hard. Well, well, the thing is, many, many players doing. say this, so, so they go, well, you know, you're playing that much, you know, when I was coaching Daria, I had a, a Swedish girl, she goes, well, uh, you, you know, it's, it's not important, I tell her, okay, one hour of, of serve every morning, four hours of tennis, super, super tough, like almost no rest, yeah. just boom, 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 yeah. and we would have maybe on average like one rest day every other week, you know, like, or when she, whenever she was tired, not like, oh, we have to have it on Sunday, you know, because when she was tired, I would see, okay, we'd rest. And, uh, and it was really tough. They, and the girl goes, the Swedish girl goes, oh, but it's better to train, you know, if you can train one and a half hour smart yeah. instead of four hours not smart. I go, well, but she is training four hours tough, like really training hard, and you're not training hard for one and a half. It's not like you're doing it smarter than she is. <laughs> right. So you just, you're just saying this. And you were ranked 600, and, you know, she's moving up like a rocket. So... Maybe this is, and they don't understand this. Like for me, I went to uh, Hawaii in 20, uh, whatever it was, 17 or something. And I was there for a month. Uh, I stayed at the friend's house who actually lives here now. We're going to go for, a, yeah, we're going to have, have dinner tonight. And she, um, uh, I got a really cheap ticket, but it was, I had to go from, I think from London to, to Portland 
on the way there and then to Hawaii. And then on the way back, I had like a, because it was in, the way back was on New Year's Eve. So it was like an eight or nine hour layover in Salt Lake City. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so I was on the airport. But I got in 500 burpees in that time. You know, it was amazing. Like I did that, not in a row. I would like 50 burpees and I would like, you know, get a drink and I would do 50 more. And I would like watch something on YouTube and 50 more. And I was just doing my burpees. I was like, yeah, you get something in. In the airport? Yeah. I switched clothes because I, I was traveling with no, no check-in. I just usually have hand luggage. So it's like, yeah, I went to wash off and change my clothes. And then that was fine. Like to do something. Why yeah. not? Yeah. yeah. But nowadays it's like, no. And the people are like, when they're done, even going up, but going down an escalator. Why are you standing still? Like, don't you want to get to where you're going? <laughs> and when they're standing next to each other, like, okay, at least go to the right so I can pass you, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, but everyone is like this. You just want to... And it's, so... It's almost like they don't want you to pass them either. Yeah, yeah but like, it, it's like the decay of civilization that everyone has to make everything. Isn't like the, the, the movie Wall-E? Yeah. With yeah, the, yeah when yeah. everyone Everyone's is like sitting, sitting like, this, yeah. like, like this. And even in Sweden now, we are over 50% overweight. So like Sweden, really? Yes, over fifty percent overweight. Not obese, but overweight, uh, over fifty percent. So wow. this is a problem. And people are like, can you just move a little bit? Like, what's wrong? I, wh- why did I go here today? I've done eleven miles, or yeah, about running. And yeah, I'm, then if we're done here. I'm gonna run back to Manhattan again. It's gonna be like another eight or something. So it's why not? Like, move around. Like once you're used to it, it's not that tough anymore. Yeah. So for someone who's not running, like, oh, run a little miles, you're crazy. But why not? If I have the time, it's amazing. Yeah. Over the bridge, you know, and you do some stories on your, your Instagram, you listen to a podcast, you stop for a coffee on the way. And it's like, yeah, I, it's just great. But if you're not used to it, it's tough. Yeah. But don't you want to be in good shape? Yeah. It, it's, it's a great feeling to know that I can go out anytime. If you ask me, oh, Thomas, can you like help me out? Like I'm going on June 1st. It's the Stockholm Marathon. So I'm going with a friend. Uh, that I helped with weight loss before because I do some work with that also. So he lost 33.3 kgs, which is wow. a lot. He's a little bit my height. So. And he wants to do the sub four hour marathon. So usually what I do when I run with someone because there's so many people at the aid stations, so I will have them so they don't have to stop because your muscles get cramping. Mm-hmm. So they go to the left where there's no people. And I run over there. I get some water. I run over with the water to them. I run back and they keep going and I get some sports drink and I run back to them. So I go to leapfrog and do these things. And... To be able to just do this, and it's like nothing to look at three hour, three hour, 30 minute marathon. Yeah. It's a good feeling. Yeah. And I understand why not everyone wants this to have a good, I mean, you don't have to be extreme, but at least move. And it's, it's, it's gone far. And I think with tennis players today, they don't want to say, oh, no, that's too much for me. Instead, they go, well, I think this is better. You know, I have this rubber band and I have this foam roller, you know, and, and then you have, you have, uh, you know, the, the, the SNC coaches who go like, oh, but I can help you with the program. And they do that. So they have someone, so like you're a player, you know someone, and they say, oh, you don't have, you know, you cannot afford to have like a full-time coach. Oh, I'm going to help you with this. This coach is good with fitness. And they give you a program. And the coach does it for free because he's friends with Mm -hmm. the person who Mm -hmm. wants to help. And they give them something. And they have a little bit of a contact over WhatsApp or whatever, or some video calls sometimes. And he can say that he has been the, the fitness coach of this person ranked 500, yeah. which it doesn't really mean anything to someone outside of tennis. They don't know. Yeah. They can, oh, I, I coach as professionals. So they can put it on their resume. But then they're making this program. And I look at this and I'm like, but you're doing a one hour and 45 minutes, four or five days a week. And you could have, you could have cut this down to 20 minutes because one hour and you know, 20 minutes or 25 minutes is, is, is crap. You, you yeah. don't have to do this. You can just do 25 minutes and we're out. But then again, it's the placebo effect. If you feel that you're doing one hour and 45 minutes per day, four or five days a week, you're going to feel like an animal yeah. mentally because you think you're doing yeah. something. Yeah, and yeah. I'm like, I, I'm more about efficiency. I think like when you're working, you should be working. And, and in tennis, you need to be working hard. Well, it's also interesting with ATP specifically. Yeah. Um, it's almost, it, there's actual, I mean, matches go on for five hours sometimes. Yeah. They go on. I mean, especially Grand Slams, you'll have matches that are that are four, five, six hours. So to think that, oh, I can just train an hour and a half and then be yeah. done. And as long as it's a smart hour and a half, I'm good. Yeah. Like, how do you, how are you possibly prepared for, for a yeah. five hour match? You're just not. Like, but there's you, just, you on, have to. But you cannot bring logic into this because that doesn't, that, no. <laughs> it's all, feel, you know how, the, you're Americans. You know, and, and the rest of the world, whether we want to uh, admit it or not, everything that, you know, like most things comes from the U.S., right? Like everyone watches what happens and people are crazy here. 
you know, everything has to be, oh, it's so nice and this and that. And that's, that's also a thing. I know this in tennis coaching, tennis, co and I, this is not something that for me, now that I'm, I'm old and bald and ugly and I, you know, I know I, I was always ugly, but, <laughs> but it's like, it's, it's a, every, you could think now that I'm as old and bitter, but I'm not like, I understood this. I think it was like two years in to being a coach. I realized you have to take one of, or have to, but you, for me, it was like one of two ways to do this. Either I just, you know, put my head down, I put in a lot of hours, I work hard and I try to get results. Or what I can do is I can just basically kind of work, be nice so everyone loves me, kiss butt pretty much, mm -hmm. and then I will get up there. Because at the end of the day, and, and I found this early, is that it doesn't, I, I, let's say I don't know, because I don't think that Daria that I coached to 271, I don't think that she has a full-time coach. I don't really know. Because it's not someone that I know. I think it's someone from you, from uh, not you, sorry, uh, from Latvia or something. But let's say that that someone gets in now and starts coaching her, and she's one ten. And let's say that she goes to one fifty, right? That coach is going to get more jobs from that than I am from getting her from twelve hundred to two seventy one. Mm -hmm. Because right. on a CV, it's much better to put I coach this person who was this ranking. Yes, you and know, put one ten. Yes, and also this is so funny. We had there was one guy. I, I, I'm not certainly not going to name the name, but as a coach, and he he was in an academy, and they said, oh, he coached this this American woman, oh, she was she he used to be he was like like me with that, 50 months I think the last 50 months before coming to our academy they put like a news yeah the, the last 50 months um, he coached this girl X uh, and she was 89 in the world no career high 89 in the world he said and that was true. He never coached her at 89, though. Yeah. He coached her from 130, I think, like 135 to 156. Mm. And she never, she was, one, I think, 135 or 134, because I checked it, obviously. I could tell when they started, and yeah. I could tell when I knew when, when he started with the academy. And she was like 135. She never surpassed that, and she was 156 when they quit. But he got to go to all the Grand Slams. So he, I coached at all the Grand Slams. Have you? I would like, no. I have never coached at a Grand Slam. So you get more from that. Right. You know, and but this is not for me. I, I realized this very early, even the same thing with the national thing in Sweden. You have coaches at the biggest clubs, and they're like, you know, it's never gone well, ever. You know, of course, you're gonna have some Swedish champions because you're the biggest club in Sweden and everyone comes there, but they had the same amount of Swedish champions every, you know, since sure. as long as I've lived. And, and that's that's a bigger thing. So, if like if this young coach look watching this, if you want to make a career, it's more important to have someone with a high ranking than to actually get results. You know, you can't have obviously crap results all the time because then they're going to, but that, that's more important. All right. So we're taking a little break now because, uh, Steven's feeling a little tired. He's feeling a little fatigued. Yeah. He's been talking a lot, a lot of effort, a lot of energy spent. Um, so we're taking a second upon his request. I will, I will say, I will say, uh, this is the perfect time for a magic mind break and I highly suggest you do the same. Um, because I already had, uh, my coffee in the morning. Okay. And I've been trying to now recently not fall to that second cup of coffee. And what I will say is, you know how like when you have that second cup of coffee, uh, usually like in the middle of these podcasts, you'll, you get the little slump. You get the, the, the tail Flash. end of the podcast slump. Well, uh, we've been, I've been doing Magic Mind recently instead of drinking that uh, second cup of coffee. And I tell you, I don't have the slump anymore. That's why you've seen the level of effort the level of creativity that I have been bringing to our videos recently. Right. Okay. And I, what I will tell you is you're slacking. I will say no. I will say when I'm editing and I write you at three in the morning. Yeah. And you obviously don't respond <laughs> because I'm doing all the work. Um, and then I'm worried. My, my concern is when I edit late, I think to myself, well, is this going to ruin the following day? Right. The fact that I stayed up till three, four in the morning, four hours of sleep, you know, am I going to wake up? And am I going to feel are tired? Feel, are you going to feel motivated this, to work with This me? makes me a little bit more confident that yeah. my day is going to go well. So right. Exactly. And, and, and they, are the, they are the sponsor of this episode. So guys, we, we, we actually did hook you guys up. Uh, if you use uh, code JUSTSLAP20, uh, you will get a discount. You're welcome for helping you out. All right? <laughs> I want to ask you because there's, the, there's a lot of things that that – get weaving in here that I think can make things complicated. Like for example, money, right? Mm -hmm. Like ranking money, like there's all these things like your goal is to make this player better, 
right? But at the end of the day, it is like a business, especially if you're a club or an organization like that. Mm -hmm. Like at the end of the day, there is like a business component to it. So like, ha like as a coach, I would imagine you value, uh, like at the end of the day, you're, you're not doing this to make the most amount of money. You're doing this because this is your passion. So, so, but you also have to support yourself. Right. And you mentioned there's times where players are not doing well or whatever the case may be. And like you, they can't afford to, to pay you right now because, yeah. right. So how do you kind of like balance the two between if you're a coach or if you're a player? I think that, that the coaches, they, the, the ones that I talk to, they don't really. So for me, I'm on um, Orange Coach and Sports Pro Connect and these, some of these I've been for a long time. Yes, to be on them because you pay like 50 bucks for a year or something and then, you know, this job placement or whatever. And I've had some players reach out, but I've also had some, a lot of job opportunities from like academies around the world. And uh, I know coaches who go and they, you know, you go to Dubai or you go to India or whatever and you can make like five, six, seven, eight K per month. Do that. And uh, yeah, it's good money. And uh, like if you go to Dubai, it's tax free, obviously. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, you, you can do that. And but if you want, if you have someone, and you can see, okay, if this person dedicates themselves and they really want to do it, and if if I, it turns out that I know what I'm doing, kind of, as a coach, and we just go for it, like nothing else matters. We're gonna make you as good as possible. Then then the results are gonna come. And for me, I mean, like like with Naria, and I've done this other times also, but with her it was extreme because I got 540 euros which is about the equivalent of dollars um, per month. I gave it five times out of 15 to her. I never took the 10%, the half of the 20%. And we were staying, we were four weeks in Cancun, uh, where she won three, the three last tournaments in a row. And I was sleeping on a couch. And she was with, they had another girls with us so they could share their costs because at the time. They were living mm -hmm. upstairs, they had each other bedroom. I was sleeping on a couch, it was like, it was like two feet too short. So I had my, my feet were on a chair, chair for four weeks. Like these kind of things all the time just to make it, you know, so that we could just make it. And for me, the, why not? Like, I don't care. I'm good at sleeping though. And like, you know, and I'm always happy. So for me, it's like, I always have energy. So, you know, as long as I can go to Starbucks sometimes and I can go running, I'm fine. So for me, I would just, you know, if there's someone who really wants to go for it. And so she really wanted to, to be good, but you'd be like, most don't. And I always say, if you are, let's say that you're a woman, you have a boyfriend, for instance, and you say, in my, in my, I, tennis is first, but in my, when I have time off, like when I've done everything, I want to spend time with my boyfriend. I was like, cool, of course. But if you say, I can only travel for two weeks because then, you know, I'm, I'm going to get homesick because I won't have to be with my boyfriend. Or I have to have this weekend off because I want to be with my boyfriend. Then we have a problem. You're not going to reach your full potential. Because you're putting it over the... Yeah, the, tennis the, has the to goal. be number one. You can't be going to like, like this crazy, like going to weddings. We went to a wedding. Fernanda yeah, went to a wedding for four days. We got like three hours in for four days. And it was nice enough. Like just a nice hotel in, in uh, whatever we was, we were. Um, but it's like, I mean, for me, it's like, why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. Like, I can sleep on the floor if you just train as hard as we're supposed to. I don't want to go to a wedding. Why, why am I going? Oh, I have to go. People say this. Like, oh, I, go, I have to go see my family. Aren't you a tennis player? Like, why? Like, if, if I mean, they're going to be there afterwards also. Like, you don't, like, why are you? I, for me, I, I, either you, you have a goal, either you go for that goal or you don't. You can't be halfway pregnant, you know? Yeah. You can't both have a baby but never become pregnant. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be some work. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. But they don't want to go all in, like almost no one. And you can tell. There's a lot of girls when I was like in Guadalajara in the 1000, and I got to spend a lot of time around, around the best players and their coaches and everything. And, and there, was, there were a lot of things there that, that really kind of surprised me. I mean, I know how it is on the lower levels, but it's the same. It's like they, they reach that where they are and obviously they're talented and everything, but I think many of them have played a lot of tennis when they're younger and they're extremely good now, but what they're doing right now is just like a kind of maintenance, you know? They think they're still going for it, but come on. Just like going through the motions. So why, yeah. why do most tennis players do that on tour? Is it just because it's so hard and it's hard to continuously motivate yourself or what's the reason you think? I think, the, for, well, the thing is this, like the, the better you get, the more you have to work for less. You know, so if you are 150 in Sweden and you're playing tennis twice per week and you're 150 in your age group and you go and, and you say like, oh, and you, you know, oh, I say you are my, my brother and your son is playing. So, hey, do you wanna, I have two days a week. You want to go down and do some serves and we'll go for a jog twice per week? 
And he thinks, oh, it's fun because, you know, he wants to hang out with his uncle and we have fun. We practice surf for 45 minutes. We jog for 30 minutes. And we do that twice per week. You can go from 150 to 110 in, in, in a very quickly because you don't have to do much because it's like a low, low level. But then it's high, you know, the higher you get. So when you're a top 100 player, if you are top 100, you're set. You know, if you want to like, let's say like this, if you live in Spain and if you would have 1500 bucks per month, you have a great life. Yeah, a great life. So, with that, you know, and it's nice. It's super nice. The weather's great. You can have a great life there for that little money. So, the money you're making if you're 10 years top between like 80 and 280, most of the time in the upper, but like kind of there, you can have a pretty good life. And so, if you ranked 100, 150, like yeah, you, it's it's, but you're not gonna say no. I'm happy with this. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna cruise now. No. They're still, they're still kind of pretending and they get offended if you say that they're not doing everything they can. But many times, some of them do, but many times it's like, well, okay, come on. Yeah. You know. You have some players that admit it though. Yeah. As occasionally you have players that just like, but yeah, not, I play for but, money. Yeah, but many of them get, yeah, but yeah, but playing for money is one thing, but like then you, but also to get better, you know, to, to make more money. Yeah. But, but just the thing that players that say, I could do a lot more, but I'm just too lazy or it, it you know it's it's semantics i guess uh it, are you too lazy or is it just that you feel the juice is not worth the squeeze right and that's okay you get to choose sure but i, I i'm not saying it's wrong you can do whatever you want and they're 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 doing well you know like if you're top on a tennis player nice you're amazing right but a lot of them could be a lot better right but it's like they're happy with it and they i don't think they even know themselves that they're not going 100 percent. but it's, a, it's what you're thinking and what you're saying to me and what i'm seeing it's not like I'm the, the, the Einstein, the god of tennis, <laughs> but I can see that this is not 100%. Right. Like how many tennis players do you know? Like how many female players, te tennis players do you have you seen that after practice, after practice, they have to lay down? Like this is, I, I have to lay down for 10 minutes because I can't get up. How, how often does that happen? Never. Never. <laughs> Daria had those. She worked like crazy. So after two hours, she was like, you know, almost like crawling out of the court. She would go to the shower and she would go to sleep <laughs> for two hours. Mm -hmm. And then we'd have lunch and she'd warm up and she'd have another two hours. And then in the afternoon, like after we have done whatever we were supposed to, she was dead. So when she took a rest day, she needed a rest day. But I've had other, other players I've had. It's like, oh, what, what do you want to do tomorrow? And what time is it? Sunday. I have a rest day tomorrow. I'm going to go with my friends and this because, you know, it's rest day. Look at me like, you're you know, crazy. like, what are you saying? It's, it's, it, you know, and, and I'm like, but okay, but you haven't really done anything in the week I think but if you say that they're gonna just feel bad right so it's, it's it's always this balance how much should you say this is what I had with Daria with what, what what I think I failed with her the most of it maybe she has something else to say also but is that I I couldn't really get her to, to take that rest but also how should I say it because if I when we went to Georgia for instance all of a sudden she wanted to go to Georgia from from clay in in, in Spain and we had said we we're going to go clay in the clay season, hardcore on the hardcore season, and once you get to Wimbledon, we'll have a grass season. And we were clear on that. But she saw the possibilities, and she didn't want to play qualies. And at that time, she had to play qualies in, in Central Europe uh, on the clay, and she didn't like the super time in the third because sometimes she had a bad start or whatever, and she wouldn't be able to grind them down. It was more of a lottery. It didn't suit her, she thought. And I tried to have her do that, but no. So we went to Georgia for three weeks, and it was so hard the surface. It's mm -hmm. like when you're doing the New York Marathon because it's a concrete here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're used to asphalt and asphalt is actually kind of bungee <laughs> yeah. if you compare it to, to, concrete. To, uh, to concrete. So concrete, you get more tired. I remember, yes, she had sparring to, because she was really great with this. She, like, she had two girls to spar with. She had like three hours of practice like when we get there, like the, the second day. We got there at night. We did it and I was just walking around, you know, talking to her a little bit, giving some instructions, whatever, getting balls like this, getting water. And, and I was, my legs were tired from that court because it was so hard. It was like, I don't know what the, you know, it was so tough. So, but then they, they come and say, okay. And I knew this because I made the research before. I was like, how, how much should I push this? Because I had already seen that there was some tendencies of her getting injured. How much should I push this? Because if she's still going to want to go and we go and I push it too far, she's going to feel that I'm undermining her confidence and whatever right so you have to try to get your point across but if you say like no you're insane we're not going there this is the dumbest move ever which i was feeling 
if I said it like that, then she'd be like, oh my goodness. And then maybe she's in the match and it's like, yeah, maybe he's right. I'm not playing well. Or, oh, maybe my, you know, my feet are hurting or yeah. so, so you don't want to, you know, it's, it's, I think it's super tough. Yeah. I am the kind of person that I want to know, like you can tell me anything and, and I want, I want the facts. This is the way it is. Like, you know, this is what you feel. And then at, at the end of the day, you, you tell me what you feel. You tell me how you think. And at the end of the day, I make the decision because it's my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if I, if I take your advice and, and it goes to hell, it's not your fault. You just gave me advice. I'm the one who took it. It's all you all the time. You know, no matter, no matter what. I mean, if you're an adult, you're, you know, the decisions you make, that, that's, that's all you, right? But I think this is, the, this is the tough thing with the communication is this. And some of the, I mean, the, the, I think they get also caught up. I was coaching this Swedish girl uh, right after Daria. And uh, she, we, I was living with them in Sweden, and uh, we uh, we went for tournaments, and so we went. And it was, a, it was a, I, I was I I made a point with her mom that if I'm gonna take this job, because I turned down some pretty good ones, you know I had I had really really good money, but if I'm gonna take this, we have to have a budget to travel. I don't need that much of a salary. I, I was pretty good, nice to them with that, but I have to pick the tournaments. Because this happened with Daria, this happened with Jacob before a little bit, but Daria was like, not good. I, I don't like what happened with the tournaments. And I want this. this. These are my terms. But then in the end of the day, it was like, she picked anyway. You know? <laughs> so we go for tournaments and whatever. We went to, to, to uh, a UTR in Spain, which she always did badly. And she did badly again. And then we went to, to Tunisia, which was not smart because it was like a 40K, then a 25K, and then 15K. And she was unranked or just got her ranking back there. So... This 15 case were okay, but if there's a four, she wanted to play 125 and two 15s. But I told her, listen, the 40 is before. So some of the people who usually don't play 25s, they're gonna stay for 25. Some people who usually don't play 15s, they're yeah, gonna stay, gonna stay after stay, 25. So and sense. that's what happened. She had good results, but she didn't win. Like she played someone who's 500, she lost in, in one break in the third. She, it was pretty good. So then we get to, we went to Dubai to play two UTRs. And it was a little bit like I had to try to convince her of what I was what I thought all the time. She's cool though. She's Maya. She's a super cool girl and she, she's super tough when she wants to be. Amazing. Amazing girl. Like super tough. So I'm really happy that I got to work with her. But we go to these two UTRs in Dubai because it's it's uh, all inclusive. So we're staying in like an Ibis hotel and the tournament is at the Palm. You know, <laughs> Atlanta's the Palm and we get to eat. The food is free. We go to the, where all the staff is eating, like a, you know, super nice buffet and everything. So it's a good place. And we go to the first one, and now it's, I think, on Amazon Prime, but back then you could watch it on YouTube live, the matches. So the first tournament is quite weak, and she, she loses one match against a Czech girl, like, in three sets. And I say to her, listen, this, I think that what, what happened, because we talk about the match, like, later, this happened, she says, no, no, I, didn't, no, I don't think so. And the second this, no, no, no. She, was, she didn't agree, and the third set, she didn't really agree. So we go back and say, listen, we're going to watch this now. Take my iPad, sit down, we have lunch, we watch it. And she had to agree with what I said because we had the proof. Yeah. Like, Perfect. So then she, got, she was number two in the group. You know, UTR, like you play the... So when you're number two, you get to play the semifinals with the twos. And then she won that and she won her finals. She, she was fifth. She got some cash. And then the next week, what happened was it was like when there was the... It was like an earthquake in Turkey. Mm -hmm. You know, in Eastern Turkey though. Yeah, but yeah, they, yeah. They, Antalya was, was uh, uh, canceled. So people just went elsewhere. So all of a sudden, the second tournament became like extremely tough like the toughest UTR I've seen. So she has uh, Carola Bejeranu, who is like Romanian uh, in, in her group, who's 562 at the time. And she had um, Anna Ureke, a Russian, who was 809. She later became 650, but she was 809 at the time. And there was like two others. And um, one girl come back from injury, a Hungarian girl that's pretty good. And I told her, listen, now we've looked through this. And what I do usually is I look through the, the, the opponents because everything, when you get up at a certain level, is on YouTube. So you can find a lot of their matches. So I go through three or four matches and I chart everything, like what they're doing. And I try to find the patterns and I give them a couple of points. And I do that with my player a lot. I, I, I usually go, I take all the matches they have. I chart every match and then I go through it and then we make, we have a breakdown of how they should play. So I usually what I do is I give the player, um, this is what you, when you're serving, this is how you're winning points. This is what you want to try to do. These are the patterns we want to try, and this is how you're losing. So try to stay away of that. But the most important thing is this is what we want. This, and the same in returning. And then we have something also that you're doing well when the ball is in play. So these three things. And then I get, depending on the player, what they want, how much they want information, one, two, three things 
that this current opponent is good or not so good at. This is what you want to get done, right? And um, so she's playing her. She's 562. When Maya was at this point, she got a ranking again. She had one before, something. So she was 1132 at the time. And this comes down to the crazy part because I remember the, the numbers, of course. And then she, uh, so she beat her 6462. And she did basically what she, she was supposed to do, which was a really good win for her. Then in the second round, she played a girl, the, the Hungarian girl was coming back, big hitter, and she won, like it was Tarbik or something, and she was, yeah, it was, uh, it was a good win. So then in the third round, she's playing a, a girl who was, because on the UTRs, you don't get a walkover if mm -hmm. they can help it, because obviously they're selling, the, like people are, have to be able to bet on the matches, so they want to have a match. So they, they got one girl that was like a, the friend, the dad was the friend of the, the fish or something. Oh, get, get her, because they couldn't get anyone. And she, this was an O and O. You know, this is supposed to be oh no. And she won, I think, three and two or something, or two and three. And it was like she was acting, she was angry, like I don't know why. It's like a girl thing. And so I was talking to her, like, what the hell? Like, come on, like you can't we have to get this, you know, like we have to get this fixed. Because this happens too much. Like you get that. And I know that she likes to have like a bit of a fight because she plays better, but when it goes overboard, it's not good. And so then she had the last match, but she won it, right? So she had three wins. So then she had the last match against Ureki, who was 809. And she was doing pretty well at the time. And I told her, listen, for this match, let's do this. Either you choose how you want to play. I will just charge the match, you know, and I will just come on, Davai. Oh, no, she said Aide. She's Serbian. Her family is Serbian. I will say Aide, you know, whatever, you know, let's go, and that's it, you know. Or I decide. But then I, if, you, if, you just, if you want me to decide, I want you to do exactly as I say. If you don't do exactly what I say, after this match, I'm going to shake your hand and I'm leaving. It's done. But you get to choose. But if you're going to let me choose, you can't, we can't half-ass it. Like, just do what I say. And then she, her best, one of her best friends was there for a vacation, so he was, she was there the second week. So, she, you know, you can be the, she can be the, the witness of this. And she goes, no, 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 it's fine. And so she goes out against Ureke and she, she wins 0-0 in this match. She, was, she did everything that she was supposed to. She played well. I asked Anna afterwards, like, was something wrong? Like, no, no. She was like, I, I don't know what happened. It's like, okay, you played well. So now in the semis, you're playing, she's playing the Christina Dinu, she, who was 306 at the moment. Now she's like 260, right? And I told her, like, I gave her some pointers. I said, listen, you're going to win this match. And the reason that you're going to win this match is because this girl... I've looked through like seven hours of her tennis from last year. I've looked through it twice. I, I, I didn't sit for 14 hours. I fast forward, obviously, mm -hmm. but I charted everything. And we know where she's going to serve on important points. And what we also know is her forehand down the line is virtually non-existent. If she puts it down the line, you're going to be able to get it. So what you're going to do is you're going to put it to her forehand. You're going to wait over there on the forehand side. And she ended up beating her 6-3 in the third, like a super tough match. And then she played Kadar, who was 4-0-6 in the finals. And she beat her 6-3 in the third. So then after that, she went out with her friend at night. You know, we were going to leave at 3 in the morning, so they didn't go to sleep. I went to the hotel. I was going through all the matches, putting the stats together. And then after that, I told her, listen, I, I could tell that she was like mentally, it, it was no more. You know, there was nothing in the tank. The battery was drained. So I told her, listen, let's, let's go home. She wanted to go to Monastir and do futures again. So listen, we've been out for seven weeks now and six tournaments. This is a long time. Let's go back home, take a few days off. You, you can be with your friends, with your family, whatever days you need. Then we start practicing a little bit tough again. And then we go out and you're going to be so good. When you just get to recharge mentally. Everyone needs this. But she felt like she wanted to, you know, you want to strike when the iron is hot. So she said, no, no, we're going to Monastery. And I tried. We had a video call with her parents. When we actually came to Monastery, I said we should go home. And, and I gave my reasons. They were like, well, Maya, you know, that... Thomas, you know, this is a good argument and maybe we should. No, I want to play. Oh, and they're like, well, Thomas, you know, she is the one playing. So <laughs> we ended up being there for four weeks. It was crap. And I, I mean, I was like, listen, I have an apartment in Antalya that I can, that I can use. We can be like six, seven, eight weeks there in a row and play 15 Ks. Mm -hmm. Let's, and, and when it's going, because in the beginning, it's tougher in the beginning of the year. We can go there. It's going to be clay season. We can do that. You can have like friends coming down. It's a nice, big apartment. You can have another player come down and, and, and share the, the cost, whatever you want. But let's do that instead. And so, oh, we can do that also, but I want to play now. And after those four weeks, it just went not, yeah, it didn't go horribly wrong, but it was, she was playing amazing. I mean, she, she but she, she was firing like, Five, she was firing on like five out of eight cylinders. So there was nothing left. 
if you sleep 12 hours every night, every night, you go sleep at 10, and like at 10, I have to like drag you down to be able to make breakfast. You know, at like 10, 15 or 10, 30, I set up the breakfast with your gluten-free bread, your almond, everything. So you come down, and then you have like two, three, four hours of sleep in the afternoon every day, and you can barely practice. I mean, you think maybe we should go back? And then after that, so then we quit. She, she, uh, she went uh, back to Sweden. She went for some tournaments. She had like one semifinal where she lost in three sets to the one girl who won in 115, and the next 15, she won the doubles. So that was like super good results for her. But after that, she hasn't had any results. And I think like this is the thing. They, they want it so much. Like now I have to, and then, yeah, you know, I, I do believe in you, coach, but, you know, I, I, it's, uh, it, it's tough. Those are the toughest things. You don't know what, I don't know what to say. I'm like, I talk a lot, but I don't have no, I don't know. For me, it's like, just tell me the facts and that's it. Yeah. But it's very hard with people to, to know what to say. Another thing is with the people who are like, if you're five, 600 and you're 28 years old, it's always this like, yes, I hear what you're saying. Yes, it makes sense. But I took myself to this position doing what I do. And it becomes kind of hard to just change something. Yeah. But then I'm like, but you're 600. Like, that's horrible. Like, you're 600. You're losing money all the time. Is this your goal, going around being 600, playing some league matches and, like, having fun and, you know, playing Uno in the, you know, lobby and monastery, eating a crappy buffet? Like, this is not my, this is not, for, this is not life for me, you know? I, I think you should be thinking, like, like Harvey in suits, like, life, life is this, I want this, mm -hmm. right? That's how you should be thinking. You might not get there, but if you're kind of happy with this, you're not going to get anywhere. That's just, you know, and being 600, no offense, but okay, if you're 600 at 17, or at, at some point you're 600, but you're going up. But if you're 600, 700 for, for more than like a year, you know, maybe it's time to start, you know, doing something differently. But you know, but this is pretty good. No? A, year, a year is a short amount of time, but I mean, like if you're 27, like you said, 28, and you're yeah, hanging but, around that area because some people get injured and then they fall off and it can be something like that a couple years and then yeah. they get back you know like I mean, it's, it's yeah but also you, i think you should look at it constantly like this thing where th this also happens nowadays i never heard this before when they go th this i don't know how you guys but uh, uh, how much you play now and everything and, and how much you're into like this you said uh, that you were like you said that it's like um that you were you liked this side of it like with the the futures yeah, in this yeah. level and, but what they do is, okay, so they have a coach and they go and the coach says, and they, oh, this is so nice. They love it because they go, oh, um, so no, no, what, what's your goal? Oh, my goal is to go out and do my best every day and get a little bit better every day. Or my goal, oh, I, I, trust the, I trust the process. I'm thinking long term. These things are like, it's like saying, well, what do you do for life, Thomas? I'm a life coach. Well, I, I, I have something to eat and drink every day. I go take a crap, I pee, I sleep. Like I take a shower. It's like, oh, amazing. Oh, my goodness. This is amazing. Everybody does that. If you have a coach, this is my, my opinion, okay? The first, the first advice to a younger coach, if you want to move up, it will be more important for you to be with someone, the higher ranking they have, the better for your career. Not necessarily that they're winning, okay? And the second piece of advice is this. If you're getting, this camera, if you're getting, <laughs> a, if, if you're getting a coach and they, start, they cannot talk about winning or losing, change coaches, why do you think a coach doesn't want to talk about winning or losing? Because then it puts the pressure on his results. Well, it doesn't. To me, it doesn't. It, so for me, what I think is it's because you don't know how they win or lose. If, you knew, if I knew how you were going to win, like, th why wouldn't I want to talk about it? That's yeah. dumb, right? But th th this is like a, it's like a, it, it's a backward way of thinking because let's say that you're a player. Okay? I'm coaching you. And everyone has some kind of stress, right? Everyone has a bit of or a lot, some level of stress. They, they know, they're, even if their parents have a lot of money, they know that the parents are paying, they feel bad about it, you know, they might have a sponsor, am I still going to have that sponsor, they, they have self-doubts, you have all of these things. So what they want to say is, no, no, we always go out and try to do our best every day and whatever. What is that? that that's nothing. For me, like, if I say to you, listen, I've, I've checked it. I watched through, like with, with Daria, I know how she wins and loses. I know how I would coach against her, I know how I coached her, and I know, I knew where she lost all her points. I knew where she's winning all her points, not because I am super smart or because I have like, oh, this feeling on like home and then I know. No, it's not, it's not like, like, you know, the, 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 the spirits are coming to me because we look through the matches and we look through the stats. 
you know what they're going to do. And you know where you win your points and you know where you lose your points. So if I say to you, okay, this is how you win points. We're going to focus on this. And if you, we know, if you're Maria Sakkari and you have an amazing forehand cross court, and we know that, right? So then, okay, try to get a bit more angle on it sometimes and play it a bit more so you open the court a little bit more. And we know this is what you're supposed to do. And then you open the court and then you go down the line. We, let's say, we know that this is how you're winning your points. Then you might have a match where you're not able to execute. That's fine. Then we can practice it more. But we should talk about winning and losing and how you're doing it. But isn't that it's, the process? Well, like what you're describing. So, because, like, for example, let's say you're a player and you are beating everyone uh, outside of the top 250. As soon as you get to 250, uh, people expose a specific part of your game. Let's say yeah. it's backhand cross court, and 80% of the unforced errors you're making are backhands cross court. Yeah. Let's say, just for the sake of the example, you're going to tell your player, we need to train back, backhand cross court, and you're going to do it, you're going to try to be consistent on your backhands in every match, even if that means you lose the match because you're hitting more backhands, right? So that well, technically, that's a way for them to win because then they'll, let's say they stop making backhands because they practice backhands. They've lost initially, but now they're winning. Isn't that well, the process when people say, like, trust the process? Well, well kind of, but uh, yeah, but you have that also. But for me, it's like, I, I wouldn't say, okay, when this, I, I, I would rather say, how do we get away from this? Right. If you're a junior, if you're, if you're 14, and we're feeling, listen, when you get stuck in the back end and you're playing cross courts, like, that's where you lose because you get stuck because your back end is not good enough or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, like you have a one-hander maybe and this is going to get better when you're older. We're going to get you stronger. This is going to happen or we have a right. process and whatever. But when you're a pro, I don't go by that. I say, listen, we're going to get you to the, where you get to play your strengths all the time. That's what we're doing. Your strengths right. are these. We're going for this. Yeah. Because like with Daria, she was 18 and... Uh, and, and, and Maya was 20, Fernanda was 26. It's like, or 27, th they're gonna have certain things that they're good at and certain things they're not that good at. And the things that they're not that good at, it's so much, like, like again, the juice is not worth the squeeze to try to start and practice this. Right. Just get, like Andy Roddick, which is one favorite always because he, yeah. and he was fun in press conferences yeah. and always and, and everything. But when he, I remember when uh, he had Larry Stefanke as a coach and he said like, no, we just, because his backhand wasn't that good. Mm -hmm. And they were like, no, we're not gonna, we're not gonna practice your backhand. We're gonna start slicing. Just slice it, yeah. And then make sure that you get to, to move around. Yeah. And where, I, I guess also, like how, how do the other people, the other player, how do they expose your backhand? So where, so where it goes, like you're stuck there or your slice is not good enough. Okay, can we get out of that? And usually that's it, because I know many girls that play a certain way. We have a Swedish girl, and the same with Daria. They're kind of the same, but yeah. And you know that don't do this thing. If you do this thing, they're amazing. But do this thing, and they're not that amazing anymore. But people still do the thing that, to make them amazing. And I'm like, just, I, I, I don't know. I think that, I don't know if people talk about tactics at, at all sometimes. There are players that are just so good and they can just beat others, but then there are other yeah. players who can just drag other people down. Of course. And it's like, like, uh, like Fabian's a, a great exa example. Yeah. If you go and you hit balls with him down the center, cross court, yeah. he could beat a, th he's beaten 13 something UTRs, I remember in college, yeah. because they just played into his game. I could take an eight UTR that just shovels balls <laughs> and hits a short, he lose. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm not saying actually, but it would be like two different players. You would say there's yeah, yeah, yeah. no way that this guy who just had this struggle of a match against a nine UTR who's shoveling and slicing yeah, yeah, yeah. and bringing him in a beat a 13.5. There's no, no, no way. Yeah. But it's true. It's like this yeah. is a completely different player simply because there were times where someone like Fabian, and, and yeah. uh, this applies to every tennis player, but they get dragged down by just yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the way that that player plays. Of course, I told Fabian, I remember I told him, uh, like, you could be a sparring partner to anyone. If you're doing cross court, like you can, you can start sparring with Djokovic. Yeah. Like, I mean, you won't get a game from him unless you change this and this and this. You're not gonna you're not gonna you know, really get any better, I think. But you could spar with anyone. Yeah. He's amazing, strong guy. He's great work ethic. Hits the ball well. But if he gets out of and this is kind of the the way that women's tennis is. There are some girls that are just good at finding ways to win, of course. But there are not that many girls who are that all round. You know that they can they can actually like usually they have their patterns they have the things that they want to do that's why also sometimes there's a player who obviously this is obvious that you have one player who's like really good and you have and they have such hard time with this 
not so good one just because their games they don't add up mm. and that happens but most of the time you can get a lot better a lot quicker by just they like like alicia parks take her for example like she has like a 14 match losing streak she can even beat a 290 now in 125 k i mean it because she just hits balls but i saw some of the the highlights from the matches like she hits well there's nothing wrong with her physically she's good she's cool like it's a cool person but She's just going out there and like, okay, let's go out. We hit tennis balls and we see who's the best. And she's just hitting tennis balls. That's how it looks. Yeah. yeah. She's not playing to her strengths at all. And if you don't, then you have to be, I mean, imagine how much better you have to be to beat someone if you're just hitting. I right? I mean, I always, I always thought about it as two separate things. Like I always thought about playing well is one thing and then winning is a completely other thing. Like you could have a shit day and play terribly yeah, yeah. and still find a way to win. You could have the best day ever and still find a way to lose, yeah. right? So, and I, and I think, because you mentioned before, like a lot of coaches are not stressing on winning or losing. I think there's also other aspects that go into here. It's like, one, if you're stressing, okay, like we're, this is the obvious, but like if you're saying, okay, we need to win or lose, like I mean, we need to win, uh, and that's the important part, and you're not winning, now it kind of looks like you're not doing your job, right? So they almost, it's almost like I want to take the pressure away from yeah, yeah. the actual results that are what matter, yeah, yeah. right, to... As long as we play well and we're improving, like this, yeah. like ambiguous kind of metric that you could measure. Um, so, but like, I, like I agree with you. I think I think at the end of the day, you're there to win. And also, for me, it's like this. I, I could say because there are some things, I, and, and if they are true or not, it's up to I don't know. I I, I cannot say statistically, but like if you say, for instance, and and obviously I'm I'm biased because I wasn't a good player. I played D two tennis. You know, so and I started when I was 14, so I wasn't good. But for me, the thing was to say, like, people think that if you were a good player, you're going to be a good coach. And that is, I mean, I don't know per the percentages because I know Nick Politeri wasn't a good player, you know. But then again, Brett Gilbert was world, was world number four yeah. and he was amazing. But yeah. Landstorp wasn't that good. Yeah. And, and but then again, you have someone else, you know, you have whatever and, and you have different. So that that can be both, I think. But also, I think with, with coaching, I think it's... Um, I, I mean, you have to decide. For me, it's like, I want to take the pressure off the player by saying, if you do what I say, you will win. If you don't win, fire me. It's my fault. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll take that. It's fine. You know? And if I tell you, okay, let's, to make it like simply, if I tell you, play forehands down line all the time, yeah? and you do it, and it's not working, I'm not going to say, oh, but you didn't do it the correct... No, if you, if you do it and it doesn't work, we can talk about it. But at the end of the day, if you're not winning, it's going to be my fault. Yeah. If you do what I say. But if you say, no, no, I wanted this, I wanted that, then, you know, and I want to, I want you to blame me. Because the other thing with coaching is they think that it's harder to coach someone on a higher level than a lower level, which is, I was talking to, um, to a friend, Mariano, uh, in, in uh, Alicante, he's there. And uh, he is now coaching with Ruben Hidalgo Ramirez, who was number 50. He was mm -hmm. his coach before. And I was with Jacob. Um, before there and we were practicing with Alexander Weiss Italian guy I think he's like 300 now but Jacob he was 550 I think then and they were practicing and they were doing sparring and afterwards I was talking to Mariano and I asked him what because you coached a 50 and now you're coaching a 550 here among other players because he had a bigger team now uh, with players and, and uh, what is the difference between coaching a 50 and a 550 and he was like well first of all you have to have the, the personal connection has to be good like socially and everything. but other than that like it's just that the 50 is better <laughs> but there's no there's no difference it was not harder to coach him than the 550 they're like, just after, a better player yeah they're just better and this is this is my my feeling also from all these years that i've been going at it it's like first i had my clubs and, and my in the regions first they got better in the districts regions then they got you know up to be among the top 10 in sweden and then that was going well and then i sent players to college and and they they have done really well results wise they've gone to great schools like duke ucla uh, Harvard, Princeton, Columbia Law School, like they've done good things, you know, with their tennis. It's been going real well. So I did that. My last two guys, they just had two twins. The second one was one year after, but they just finished Harvard Law School. The last people I have. So they've been doing well. And that's okay. I'm kind of done with that. And then I go, I had Daria, she was doing well. The other two, like, I mean, we can say whatever we want, but again, with, with like with Fernanda also, she had a 36, the year before, like in the year, in 2023, bef before me, she had a 36.0% wins. <laughs> and with me, with, if you only take ITF, WTA, she was at 50%. If you take the UTR and the Central American Games, she was 61. 
and now she's at 30, 37 again, and she's ranked 800. So I'm hoping that she's going to do better, and she has the potential for it, obviously, so I'm hoping that she goes up. But I can only say that, okay, like with the ones that I've had, they've done better with me than they did before. That, that 100% with the players that I've had. And that's something that I'm super proud of, that that's been it. And then you can always say, yes, but if anyone else who's a decent coach would have had the same place you had, you know, you were just lucky all this time. Okay, fine. But I think that, that for me, it's the same everywhere. And I think that I could do the same thing with pretty much anyone. But now I've said to myself, I'm going to go for something that I really want. I want to be super inspired. I don't feel that like someone wants to go for it. Otherwise, it's not worth it. Yeah. So that's why I have um, done part-time things. I have some people with charting matches, doing some of that stuff. One girl won water semis in the finals of a 15K when, when we were working together. And uh, I've been some weeks here and there, but I haven't done anything since, yeah, this year, I haven't done anything like full-time with anyone. And I'm not going to. Like, if, if I don't find anyone, I think I'm going to do something else. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm not going to be a college coach because that's all about recruiting. And it's, 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 I think for me, the rest is and so I'm not gonna, I wouldn't want to do that, even though it's great money to be a college coach. Uh, sometimes. Yeah, well, I had one. <laughs> sometimes not. I had one kind of like, you know, feeler if I wanted to be the, because they had an opening for the third coach yeah. of a women's team, and that would be 50K per year. And the, the assistant made 100, and the, the head coach made 200. So this is a big school. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there, there can be some good money. So you could do that, but I, I don't feel that either. And so if I can get someone who's anywhere, it doesn't matter if they're 1,000 or if they're 100 or if they're 10. I mean, I like to get results and try it. If, but they have to be like, you know, I have to feel that they want it to get yeah. better. And if they do, with me, I, I guarantee they're going to get better. I'm, and, and, you know, it's not like I'm just sitting here saying that. I'm saying, like, put me to the test. If, I'm, if it doesn't work, then fire me. I don't care. But I'm not going to just go for something just to work. That's at least not right now. I don't feel like that. I'm gonna do. If I don't get someone within the next month, I'm gonna, I'm gonna quit. I think and do something else for a while, and then we'll see. Thomas, no, thank you, man. This has been this has been awesome. Uh, hopefully, we could do it again. I mean, we could keep going for many hours, but uh, it's been great. Thank, thank you. you for flying me in from Stockholm. Yeah, the just <laughs> yeah. slap money. Yeah, yeah. So like no, people can't see it here, but like behind the cameras is just the cash gold. Is just laying around yeah, everything's so we, gold we can't disclose the location because then you're gonna have a break in so yeah. <laughs> yeah, so nice to it's, fly me in next time next time business yeah I mean I was sitting back it's like yeah come on Coach, I know we'll sorry we didn't, we didn't know how the interview was gonna go that's why we right. you know but next time now that it went well we'll fly you first yeah. class sounds good thank you so much for having me it was uh, great stuff yeah man appreciate awesome. it guys if you like that hit the like button subscribe comment all that good stuff and uh, see you next time peace, peace.